coming up on Theater Talk. Well, the other night oh, at the show, that I was sitting next to um, this, these gentlemen couple and uh, the geek who is 6'8 mm -hmm. and has an yeah. extraordinary uh, mask. He's a pinhead, right? Right. Uh, he comes out in the curtain call holding his mask, and the guy next to me went, Oh my God, he's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, Michael, I have been to Sideshow. It's wonderful, and we're going to talk about it tonight. And I have a, a long enough memory that I was at the opening night of the original production of Sideshow on Broadway in 1997. There had been a lot of tremendously exciting um, uh, buzz and previews about the show, and it got some nice reviews in New York, but it never caught on. However, the score, really one of the, uh, the best scores of the last 25 years by Henry Krieger and Bill Russell, who are with us tonight on Theater Talk. That score, guys, has sort of um, lodged in the minds, or rather on the uh, CD players, of many, many people over the years and kept the phenomenon of Sideshow going for a long time. It seems to have been a very good tool to keep it alive. Yeah, yeah. and thanks for the nice words about the score, yeah. our score. But one person who has been a fan of the show, I think, a long time, uh, probably since he saw it originally on Broadway, is the uh, writer and director Bill Condon. That's right. Who has, uh, with Henry and Bill, rethought the show. You opened it at the Kennedy Center this past summer to excellent reviews, and now it is here in New York. Yes. So it's a, it's a show that you believed in from the very beginning, Bill? Absolutely. You know, I saw it as a fan first. Um, Went back many times in New York, actually saw a great production in California. And then Henry and I had the great pleasure of working together on the Dream Girls movie, mm. um, which was not only taking the show and putting it on screen, but Henry wrote a lot of new songs. And with that, it just felt as though we, we, we didn't want to stop doing it. Right? Yeah, I couldn't yeah, imagine it, not continuing with my collaborator and great friend here. And also, you have a superbly designed production by a good old friend of ours, David Rockwell, we didn't mean to uh, ignore you at the end of the, <laughs> of the table, David. Uh, David also has a new book out called What If? The Architecture and Design of David Rockwell. So, gentlemen, from the Sideshow Gang, welcome to Thank Theater you. Talk. Didn't you and David meet at the Oscars? That's right. David designed the Oscars that I produced in 2009. We actually met at the Algonquin over That's a right, drink. to talk about it, yes. And Bill said, how would you like to uh, work on the production zone of the Oscars? And after several drinks... <laughs> he said yes. <laughs> we decided, you know, that it, it could use reinvention, and it was it was thrilling and amazing and terrifying and uh, a, you know a fantastic experience. So I would do anything with Bill. Okay, Bill and Henry, take me back to the initial impulse for Sideshow, which is about um, Violet and Daisy Hilton, Siamese twins of uh, of the 1920s, I believe, was their sort of era. 30s is probably closer. 30, yeah. yeah, it's an odd subject matter, I must say, for a Broadway musical. Why did you guys hit on this? Well, in 1985, Bobby Longbottom, who directed the original production, said to me that his friend Russell had seen this terrible movie called Chained for Life <laughs> at yeah. 4 in the morning on television in Chicago, and it starred these real-life conjoined twins who sang and danced and played musical instruments, and he said, I think we should do a musical about them, and I immediately said, yes, that's a wonderful idea. I just thought the thought of two actors moving and singing together was so inherently theatrical. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't really get to it for another seven years. We were doing mm -hmm. our show pageant at the time. Yeah. And, um, and then we had done a little research in that time and found out more about them. And then we started in 1992 with Henry. Yeah, what brought you into it, Henry? Were you interested in this? Well, these uh, women too? yes. Well, not until uh, Bill and Bobby had contacted me. They sent me a, a letter by fax through the Dramatist Guild saying That's we had... That's how long ago it is. I know, I know. <laughs> I know it was. And uh, they said, we have a new project that we'd like to talk to you about. You're the only composer we want. Which, of course, made me very happy to hear that. And I went over and met Bill and Bobby at Bobby's apartment. And uh, their enthusiasm and their uh, unusual take on what was theatrical 
because Bill says that's inherently theatrical and it's come to pass that it is. But I didn't know that at mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't at all sure, but I did know I was interested by their dynamism, their enthusiasm, and their imagination. Bill, what was your um, attraction to it when you first saw it? You said you saw it a number of times. I saw it a number of times. The, the thing I first fell in love with was the score, honestly. It did feel like a major score. And, you know, I think like a lot of Sideshow fans, I was uh, disturbed by the fact that it didn't run as long as it should have. It always felt to me that this show, and especially the conceit of the two girls, it, it deserves its own spot in the canon, you know? And I think that's what we've, we've all been trying to, it's, it's sort of, it's putting on the show, but also making an argument for the show and for the score as something that should be with us uh, for a long time. You Did know? you see it originally in 99? I, didn't, I did not see it originally. Is that an advantage then when you are conceiving it from, from scratch? Well, it, you know, there's many shows I had seen originally and, and sort of they stay in your memory. In this case, um, what was intriguing was the score, the story and Bill's concept and the realization as we got into it that the world of the sideshow, which is a very compelling, kind of amazing, detailed world, in some ways stays with these girls wherever they go. Mm -hmm. And so physically, that was a, a really interesting key because it, it, it really took the emotion of the story and the music and moved it forward in a way that they never leave certain pieces of that, they build on it. So, so Bill, when you wanted to get the show back, it, yeah. have a place in the canon, mm. what Beyond the, the design concept, would, would we say that you have a more realistic view of it? I think that's that? true. I do think that the that, that was, um, you know, we've joked about the fact that this should have been the first production, and then Bobby's brilliant production is the great abstract revival, you know? So, yeah, exactly, you know, sort of that gets to the essence of something different. But yeah, I think, you know, the, the original instinct was to really, really make you feel that you're right there as you go into the theater, that you're surrounded by uh, these freaks and attractions, you know. F so, for example, we have a um, design team, Dave and Lou Elsie, who have worked exclusively for movies. You know, Dave won an Oscar for The Wolfman, who've come in and created um, masks for some of the attractions that are really unlike anything that's been done in the theater because they are completely photoreal. You could, they could be sitting here right now and you would think that was a person. Oh. And yet they're, you know, they've devised them so that people, can, the actors can take them off, put them yes, on again. Yes, that's remarkable yeah. how they yeah. change, yeah. 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 Is right. this really the essence of the difference between the original production and this production today, that there's a grittier, more realistic, right. well, scarier I, sensibility to it? That's part of it and I think, uh, collectively we focus more on their story. It's not quite as, much a backstage story as the original was. Uh, we have introduced a flashback in Act One that um, goes into their childhood, which was fascinating. I've often said the hardest part of writing about them was knowing what to leave out because they led such dramatic lives. Yes, and it's interesting how closely you have actually followed the lives of mm. the Hill Sisters. Mm. Yes. Did you do new songs for this? We've written a lot. Um, there's currently, I think, nine uh, that were not in the original production. But some of them, Bill looked at everything we had written over the years for the show, and uh, we went back to some things we had written earlier that weren't in the original. But Bill, when you walked in, what, the, you're going in, and you love the show to the beginning, yes. but then you said to yourself, but this has got to change. And what well, was it? Because I came into it also as a fan of the movie Freaks and knowing something yeah. about the Hilton sisters, and I think we know more about them maybe than when you first wrote Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it just felt like, my God, there are all these great dramatic events that we can drop, we can put on stage. We discussed it as a movie before we discussed doing really? a, re a revival. And, you know, movies are a more realistic medium, mm -hmm. you know? And it did feel as though there were so many possibilities for, for what we could do there. And out of those discussions, when we finally decided to do it on stage, came this whole kind of rethinking where we did explore, as you say, you know, all these big, big ideas. You know, for example, the fact that um, they were basically owned by this character, Sir, you know, someone who hadn't appeared in the original production um, and had to, to sue to, to gain their freedom or the fact that it was always considered a possibility that they could be separated. The link between them wasn't quite as complex as with other conjoined mm -hmm. twins. So injecting some of those few big ideas, suddenly, suddenly then you find the score has to change, right? Because suddenly it, 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 it pushes you into completely different directions. You know? Different ideas, different emotions, different uh, stakes. I have to say one thing about the masks, about the prosthetic mm. masks. Could you quickly tell that story about the Elderly gay couple. <laughs> well, the other night oh, at right. the show, I was sitting next to uh, this, this gentleman couple, and 
and uh, the geek who is six eight and has an yeah. extraordinary uh, mask. He's a pinhead, right? Yeah. He comes out in the curtain call holding his mask, and the guy next to me went, "Oh my God, he's gorgeous!" <laughs> Our actor is a gorgeous guy <laughs> who's wearing Matt this Davis. crazy yeah. Matt, Matt Davis. Matt Davis, right? Um, David, where do you begin the research for this? I mean, I know that you're a big believer in um, in surrounding yourself with books and pictures. What was the inspiration for your set concept? We started looking at sideshows, and in fact, one of the new pieces for New York is a show drop that shows the sideshow. Uh, but we also looked at um, German Expressionism, mm -hmm. and so realism really isn't the right word. Detailed is the right word, and in fact, some of the most emotional numbers, like uh, I Will Never Leave You, is done in a very big abstract void. Yeah. Um, so we looked at um, research from the period, but we also looked at uh, expressionism. We looked at... Um, Why expressionism? Why was that something that you thought could work in this concept? Well, because it all, it all sort of begins and ends with the movie Freaks. I don't think we'd yeah. be talking about them or making a musical about them if that movie hadn't been right. made. It was such a dominant style of Hollywood in the early 30s. Your homage to the movie Freaks within the musical oh, yeah, yeah. is a wonderful... Oh, <laughs> cool. Did you go out to Coney Island at all? Did you I, look at uh, real sideshows? I, I, I did. There's, still a, there's a really strange sideshow that's still out there that we're going to have to really? look at. Yeah. Are the sideshows now real? Really, what we would call, you know, freaks by nature. Are they now actors who are dressing up as? I don't think. That, well, they may be. I haven't been to the big. This this one did have, you know, people with uh, missing limbs and things like that. But there's no more pinheads. No, there's no, that's more. true. There weren't. But, yeah. But you know, yeah. the the takeaway from the audience is yeah. how they relate to being yeah. an outsider. Well, exactly. I think, yeah. I think it's yeah. it's really interesting that the audience comes out relating to the fact that in some way or another they they understand that feeling of being an outsider. Right, right. And well, they're confined and they're exploited. Yeah. But well, what I was found fascinating about Sideshow is, you know, it's a, uh, a world of freaks, and yet we, when we get to know Daisy and Violet Hilton, we get to know them as human beings and not, not, not freaks. We look past what it is that's making them famous and why people want to see them into people who are very different in some ways. Mm. It's like when young people come out of high school having thought of themselves as completely isolated and perhaps freaks, when they actually grow into themselves and realize that they are humans mm. and that they don't have to think of themselves like this all the time. Mm. And I think our girls did that too. I yeah. was very sorry though to learn that they died impoverished mm. bagging groceries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. the, the, the <laughs> the you highest, have their triumph and then... Yeah. They were the highest paid act in the history of vaudeville, but really? of course they had no experience handling money, money at yeah. all. They'd never been to a store to buy something in their entire lives, so... Like George they, Bush the first. <laughs> 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 That's right. Now, uh, I've always heard the story, and I want to see if you can confirm this. Is it true that when you were a kid, mm. I think you went to Columbia, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, you somehow finagled a ticket to the opening night of Dreamgirls on Broadway, and that began your career, or your love <laughs> of this man. And well, certainly that, yeah. It, it Tell me that story. It was steeped in theater before that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Sure. It was, uh, but, and I didn't, I don't think we finagled. It was my friend Ellen, who is ironically the niece of uh, uh, Paul Libin, who uh, is number two at the um, oh, that's Jew Jamson. But Jones, the St. James, right. where you're but running. Ellen organized tickets for us. We were in the back row. I think they cost $8 or something. Um, and as soon as that went on sale, she'd gotten the tickets, you know. And yes, that was, it was wild to be in that theater. That was truly, I mean. It was I, a wacky night. It right? was a wacky <laughs> night. It was, it was crazy. And that was the first time I'd ever seen a number stop the show. I mean, yeah. that, that standing ovation for her before the act ended mm -hmm. was just, and then we were right at the back and we were all up on our feet. Why do you say it was a wacky night, that opening night of Dream uh, Well, had a lot of stars who were excited to be there. The buzz had been very hot. Yeah. Yeah. And they were excited to see each other. And this, I remember Diane Cannon was in front of me and being very wild. <laughs> and in the <laughs> best possible way. And, and um, this was an unusual show, Dream Girls, in that it really told the human story of African Americans. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had a lot of uh, shows. I mean, I don't count Porgy and Bess because that's an opera. Yeah. But you had a lot of shows like Bubbling Brown Sugar and this thing and that one. Maybe Ain't Misbehavin' was more yeah. of a human story, but it was still... But the others tend to be like reviews, sort of. That's right. But this was really a, a story of human beings trying to make it and they're interrelating with one another and all that. 
and it was unusual, and we had worked for a long time to make it the best it could be. Mm -hmm. Michael Bennett and my late partner Tom Ian and all the actors who were with us from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a cauldron. It was like bubbling and bubbling. And when Jennifer Holliday would sing, people would, you know, to this well, day, we have can, to see us, to this but to day. this day, you can see the uh, the great clip of her um, doing on. I'm telling you, on the Tony Awards. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's uh, it's it's n n has still has the power to absolutely knock 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 you out. And I am telling you, Somebody was telling me, now your theater was, yes, I remember Judy Jackson, who was the press agent for Nine back then. And remember, Dream Girls at the Imperial, and Nine was at the- Next door, 46th Street, yeah. And there would come a point in Nine where there was a quiet song, and all of a sudden, they would hear the thunder <laughs> from next door. <laughs> because Ju Jennifer Holiday had just finished, and I'm telling you, I'm not going. Yeah, they didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> get satisfaction that I wrote the most amazing number in the history of American <laughs> music, of the musical theater. I mean, I, I pointed to somebody the other day, I said, and he wrote, I'm telling you, I'm not going. Well, I try to think of my life and my career day to day, fluid, yeah. moving along, and it's a very nice feeling to have written that song and to see it done on TV all the time. And one of the funny stories that I heard recently was that Jennifer Holliday was doing her own production, Theater Under the Stars, mm -hmm. and they wanted her to rehearse in the sun. They said, I can't do that. I won't. And, because she is Effie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and with all, all affection meant. And uh, so they said, all right, well, we'll get somebody to stand in for you. She said, make sure it's a white girl. <laughs> <laughs> because she was afraid if it was one of her own that... that she might she do a better <laughs> job. <laughs> possible. <laughs> but, you know, I think I, I Will Never Leave You, though, is, one of the, is a great, uh, a great song, wonderful. too. And, and I think that song, in many ways, is what often kept the idea of Sideshow around because mm. people were doing that song mm. in lots of cabarets and all that kind of stuff. Can you g give me a sense of how you actually wrote the little s s uh, story behind that song, how you wrote I Will Never Leave You? Well, that's interesting because uh, the first draft of Sideshow, uh, we had conceived that the twins would be little girls for the first third of the first act, eight-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And that was actually their first song. It was the first song we wrote for them. And it was meant to be a lullaby that they comforted each other when they were taken to these doctors who threatened to cut them apart. Well, then, it, as we thought about it and went along, and the idea of eight-year-old conjoined twins, you'd have to have two sets of them and then a set of understudies yeah. and then Kid a child wrangler. wrangler. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it was just, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So we gave up that idea and I said, well, we've got to cut I Will Never Leave You. And David Chase, our musical director, said, you can't cut that song. <laughs> so we moved it to their 11 o'clock number and wrote an intro um, leading into it where they're looking back on their childhood. But it, it never was completely satisfying to me because the lyric was intentionally so simple because right. they were little girls. Now we have restored the sequence in the first act of the flashback where they are taken to the doctors mm -hmm. and they sing that in counterpoint uh, as they're being examined. And I think it really sets up um, the song for later on. And also we have a new plot development in Act 2 that I think really helps earn that song. So, so your original conception of it was uh, the, the, the melody, which I think now is this, you know, one of these great muscular soaring Henry Krieger anthems, <laughs> was a lullaby? It was. Bill uh, had originally thought of it that way. And uh, yeah, it was like this. And now it's like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like this. <laughs> but, I mean, that's the wonderful thing about uh, this about this show, because I think a lot of contemporary shows now, the scores, while you can admire them, people tend to write on sort of a more muted mm. level. You know, mm. I don't hear these, these gigantic things that I want in the musical theater that grab you by the lapels and force you out of your seat. And this is full of them. Yeah. <laughs> full of them. And it's also, it's sort of, it, it, 
this is a show without irony, you know, and it's so, it, I think in our culture, certainly in the theater, but everywhere, everything has always got that ironic twist. And this is truly the way that Bill and Henry write. It's true, hard on their sleeves. Yes. Hard on your sleeve. It's just full out emotionalism. And I think it's very satisfying for that reason. Yes. Mm. Well, I want to ask you guys, though, uh, in the last couple of minutes we have left, it must have been difficult, though, for you with the original production to know that you have, knew that you'd written something really, really good and it just wasn't catching. I remember Manny Eisenberg, your original producer, telling me that it was the saddest experience he had in the theater because he went to this show that he loved every night and if for some reason it was just not, it was just not working. Was that the experience that you were having, too? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, the, the response was so enthusiastic, uh, and the reviews were generally very good, and yeah. the audiences were just loving it and coming back again and again, but not enough of them. And our producers, God love them, just didn't have the deep pockets of Disney or Garth Dravinsky back because then. it was the same time as Lion King and Ragtime. Right. Um, so yeah, it was frustrating that we weren't selling enough. Uh, but on the other hand, we had such passionate fans that it felt incredibly gratifying. And, and when it did close as early, I, I felt that it was definitely going to have a life because it was playing so well. And mm -hmm. that's proven to be true. Um, it was the saddest part for me was that that cast we had assembled over two and a half years of doing readings and everything. and, and that was sad. That Although your your to... leads in that, Norm Lewis, Alice Ripley, mm. Emily. They're doing they well. All, they, all, they all did very well. well. They did well. Quite well. And it's because of that show, I think. That was the show that well, really established you know, to, to add on to what Bill just said, it was mind fracking, if you get my drift. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, uh, that, <laughs> that our audiences were so loving it and that the zeitgeist at the time wasn't as open as it is now. Yeah. I mean, you have gay marriage now that is most, so many new states every every month or so we hear about, mm -hmm. and a lot of other things. Also, we were in the middle of two big, big, big musicals, which were uh, Ragtime and uh, The Lion King. Yeah, it's yeah, that little musical, The Lion King. <laughs> and, <laughs> right, right. and we were, you know, we were off brand, you know, as far as that goes. And I remember it was a snowy, sleety kind of day. And a bunch of us, I think Alice Ripley was there, I was there. We went to the TKTS in Duffy Square and we wanted to, were you there too? Or? No, I wasn't. Okay. Uh, uh, he was probably doing something that would work. <laughs> but, so we were, we were there <laughs> convincing, uh, trying to convince people to come see our show. You, you were buttonholing people yeah, on, on I line. admit it, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was this one woman and her teenage daughter, and the daughter said, Mom, I really want to go see that show. But you're not, she said. You won't be seeing <gasps> I really want to see it, but you can't. I won't let you come to that. I said, Madam, I said, I wrote Dream Girls. Everybody liked Dream Girls. I said, why don't you come? You can walk out if you don't like it, and I'll give you your tickets <gasps> back, your money for your tickets back. No. I said, we've had it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and to speak of the girl, the, also you're coming into the post-wicked world. Oh, where yeah. there's this, 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 this adolescent girls, estranged adolescent tormented girls will love this musical as they love Wicked. I, or, I, and and I think you're, I I think mean, you're yeah, right. Yeah, and Frozen. The yeah. zeitgeist moment yeah. of, of sisters or, yes. you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's big also. And also, if it hadn't have failed, you would not have gotten to this Bill Condon production. Yeah. You, yeah. you were meant and you wouldn't have David Rockwell's new set for it. Now, right. speaking of David Rockwell, I know we're, we're run out of time, but I want to call the attention of the world to this beautiful book An that David book. Rockwell yeah. has set out, which just, you know, you're, I, I don't know how you do all you do. You have the most amazing Assistance. design. Yes, yes. Staff. But Long not hours. only is this a gorgeous, uh, you know, cocktail table kind of book, but then he s it's structured so beautifully that he sets up these design problems with these wonderful pictures, shows how he solves the design problems with, uh, there at the Rockwell Group. So, I mean, I recommend this highly. Christmas is coming. Well, I think somebody once said, isn't a musical, a musical is a series of problems that have to be solved. Is that a fair assessment of this business? Certainly, once you get, yeah. once you get out of that rehearsal hall, right, it yeah. really becomes that, absolutely. Mm. I think we've got our list down pretty low now, don't we? We've, yeah. Yes, you're there. Right, you're right, there. Right, right, right. there. The rehearsal hall. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's true, yeah. yeah. Well, after, um, uh, gosh, 
what, how many years? 1997? That takes 17. 17 After 17 years, years Sideshow is finally getting, I hope, I think, <laughs> the um, accolades and the justice it deserves on Broadway. It is at the St. James Theater, written by Bill Russell and Henry Krieger, directed by Bill Condon and designed by David Rockwell. Good luck, gentlemen. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. Thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the Theater Development Fund's Technical Accessibility Program, which helps provide closed captioning. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>